And I have great news. The great news is we have another opportunity to worship God together. Isn't that great news? We want to say welcome to everybody. Welcome to our uh, folks on uh, Facebook and YouTube. And certainly welcome to everyone here in the auditorium. We have come here for a purpose, and that is to worship our great God and to be drawn closer to Him. Uh, hopefully you picked up, for those in the auditorium, you picked up an announcement sheet as you came into the auditorium. I'm not going to repeat this to you because you can read yourself. One announcement that missed it that I want to add... I want to remind you, if you want one of those phenomenal Blaze t-shirts, Billy says they're one of a kind, fantastic. The people making them are fantastic. You want one. The cutoff is October the 10th. Uh, after October the 10th, hey, we can't fulfill your request. So if you do want to receive one, uh, fill out the form out there, put it in the box, and order one, and you can be part of Blaze 2021. At this time, let's praise our God. Will? We'll be singing number 286, uh, first and last. Wonderful story. Of wake the immortal strain. Angels from rapture announce it. Shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, won't you believe it? Wonderful story of love. Wonderful. 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 Wonderful story of love. Wonderful story of love. worship you and sing songs and praise your name. We ask, Father, that you continue to bless us, each and every one of us, and continue to be with those that have lost loved ones, Larry Laquan, McKenna, family and friends, McNeil, family and friends, and the loss of Larry's wife, Alta. And we ask that you continue to be with David Pendlebury and help him, Lord, to uh, be prepared for the uh, spinal surgery he's going to need in October. Pray that uh, he'll get the best care and doctors and nurses attending him and those assisting in the surgery and the procedure to be at their best. And he will make a complete recovery. We pray. Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that you continue to be with each and every one of us and all our spiritual and physical needs that we have, emotional, financial as well. We uh, need you every day. We know that life is fragile and we can't live without you, those of us that know you. Help us to help others, Father. 
see uh, Christ living within us. Forgive us when we're not. Forgive us of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. On the south side of Birmingham, Alabama, at the corner of 15th and 15th on south side, you can go to a place that sells ribs. That's what they sell. Dreamland is its name. They have an extensive menu. It's ribs, loaf bread, and sauce. That's what you get. And they, and they ask you, do you want a half a rack or a full rack? And they always bring out a loaf of, of white bread and a, and a bowl of sauce for dipping purposes as you're waiting on these ribs. And I can eat, used to could eat, a pile of bread and sauce. That just prepares your stomach for what is about to come. However, in Matthew chapter 14, there are some loaves of bread that are mentioned there that have nothing to do with the size of the loaf that you and I think of. As a matter of fact, they're about the size of an average roll. Here's a boy who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish. He has pretty much what was left over from last night's meal. And somehow he is caught up with this crowd who is following Jesus and listening to him until the crowd begins to say, man, we are, we are starving to death. And they begin to turn and go find something to eat to which Jesus says, feed them. The apostles reply, we don't have anything to feed this kind of crowd with. There are 5,000 people here. What do you suppose we're going to feed them with? And Jesus takes a meager lunch that would feed a boy. He prays. He begins to distribute that food and they have enough food to feed the 5,000 men and to take up 12 baskets of food as uh, leftovers. Now they had more leftovers than they had food to start with. Let me ask you a question. You and I have heard that story and that account in Jesus' life all of our lives as we study through the Word of God. So this, this should be a really easy question. What's that little boy's name? How about the lady who walks into the uh, temple there and she puts those two mites into the, the contribution there of the tabernacle, or the temple rather? We know her as the widow and those two widows' mites. What's her name? How about those four men that carried their friend up on top of the roof and began to pull back the thatch roof in order to let their friend down so that he could be healed by Jesus while Jesus was being pressed into a house? Just give me one of the four names. You know what? You know why you don't know those names? Because they're never given to us. They're never given to us. And yet, you and I live in a world in which we think should run like the Cheers theme song where everyone should know our names. But for what? Well, why do I want them to know my name so badly? 
I'm just a guy from Alabama. Why do they need to know me so much? You see, the little boy, the widow, the four friends, they all throughout the New Testament exemplify Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 16. There Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount, Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. The purpose, I think, of these, uh, these accounts being in here, other than teaching us definite truths, is to point out the fact that no one even has to know my name for me to serve God. No one has to know who I am or where I live or, or, or who, what I'm supposed to be for me to serve God. What if I never get called to the greatest preaching opportunity ever? I don't even know what that would be, but what if I never get called to it? Sunday's still coming. What if I never get to the rank of whatever I want to be in my office? Uh, Sunday's still coming. What if I never have people respect me the way I want to be respected or, or look at me the way I think I ought to be looked at? Sunday's still coming. And that would be for all of us. God wants servants. And it doesn't matter if the 7.8 billion people that inhabit this earth ever know my name as long as he does. You want to know the point of life? Have him know your name. Have him know your name as his child, as, as his servant. How are you supposed to do that? It's as simple as hearing what he has to say and believing those things. It's as simple as repenting of your sin and confessing that Jesus is the Christ. It's as simple as being baptized in water for the remission of your sins. And it's as simple as living faithfully for him to honor the sacrifice that was given by the plan that was given so that he'll know my name. Does he know your name? If he doesn't, it's time to be washed. If he does, and yet you've walked away from him, it's time to come back home. And it's time to do those things right now while we stand and sing.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting everyone come here tonight, Lord, to worship you, Lord, to study more about you. Help us as we go to our classes, Lord, to be focused and take from your word, Lord, and apply it to our lives and live our lives every day for you, Lord, and to be shining lights for those in the world. Please be with the sick, Lord, and those who have lost loved ones. Please forgive us for when we sin, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. And we do want to say welcome to everybody. We say welcome to those here in the uh, auditorium and welcome to those watching on Facebook and also on YouTube. We appreciate you. Uh, do want to, um, well, I do want to click. There we go. Okay. Hey, we, there were works. Okay. Do want to remind you, uh, the new study Genesis will start uh, probably somewhere around the middle of October. If you did not get a notebook Sunday, please, after the class is over tonight, come up here and grab one of the notebooks. Uh, there are three different covers, all the same lesson, but three different covers. So you can pick your favorite cover. Also, I want to remind you of what I am really excited about, because this is something that we can do together. This is parents, uh, uh, children, grandparents, all. We can all work on a memory verse per week, a memory passage, the one that we will begin on Sunday, and you're getting an advance warning, okay? This is the one for Sunday, is John 1... Verses 1 and 2. I love this passage. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Let's say that together now, okay? Say it with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God takes you all the way back to Genesis 1. John begins his gospel by taking us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. By the way, the memory verses, because we have to pick a translation, we pick the New King James Version. So all these verses will be from the New King James Translation. So start working on that and work with your children and grandchildren. And by Sunday... Let's all be able to say it together, okay? John 1, verses 1 and 2. We're up to story number 157. We're wrapping up the final week, this very important week in the ministry of our Lord. Now, if you've got questions, please text me your questions. We'll hand those questions at the end. I do have two questions that were emailed to me uh, the last few days. I will handle those two email questions and your text questions at the very end of our class. What are we doing? We're talking about reaction. Reaction. Jesus, His Spirit, He gave up His Spirit. It says that he breathed his last. The, the, the gospel writers do not say Jesus died. Because to say that Jesus died would be to say that he succumbed to death. And that death ruled over him. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, none of the four say Jesus died. They say Jesus breathed his last. Jesus gave up his spirit. 
You see, Jesus was always in control. Let's look at the burial. What's happening? I'm going to need four men to volunteer. I need four guys to volunteer for I recruit you. Four guys. John, okay, John, uh, we're going to do something different. We're going to make you read Matthew. So every time Matthew comes up, John, read uh, Matthew. Drew, thank you for raising your hand. I appreciate that, Drew. You're going to be Mark. Ed, you're going to be Luke. And Clayton, you will be John. How about that, okay? Now, let's look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Those who are watching online... Open your Bibles, Matthew 27, verses 61 through 66. Go ahead and stand and read that, please. Every time I read this in Greek, John, I, I, I chuckle. I chuckle at what Pilate said back to these religious leaders. This is one of the few things that we know happened on what we would call Saturday. Okay, we know that Jesus died on Friday. We know what happens on Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. This is one of the few things that we know that happens on Saturday. The Jewish leaders, they panic. Uh-oh, what if they steal the body and they try to uh, say that he's risen from the dead? They, what if they fake it? So they go to Pilate and, and Pilate <laughs> basically saying, okay, you've got a guard you try to go out there and make it as secure as you can. Like you think you can make it secure. To me, it's funny. Because there's no way they were going to stop the resurrection. There was no way they could stop the resurrection. Now, I want you to notice there in verse 61, what does it say? They were sitting, these women were sitting opposite the tomb. It's a private tomb. This is not a public, mass public cemetery. There's no way that the women might go to the wrong tomb. In other words, if this is the tomb of Jesus, they don't end up going over here to the wrong tomb. They know for sure which tomb he's put in. No doubt. No doubt. Mark 15, verse 47. Love these ladies. They got faith. They've got love. Luke chapter 23, verses 55 through 56. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. Ladies, I'm not going to say this to insult you, but 2,000 years ago, your testimony wasn't worth the words that was put on the paper. That's the way it was. A testimony of a woman was not held as reliable in a court of law. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you're trying to prove something that didn't happen, why, did you, why are you using women? as your witnesses, because the women will be the main witnesses. Who were the first ones to see the risen Savior? Women. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, you're using the wrong gender. You got to use guys. But that's the way it was. You see, that's the way it was. These women, they keep their distance from the two prominent Sanhedrin members. 
uh, Joseph and, and Nicodemus. They also are standing away because of probably the, uh, the social stigma of non-related men and women. You don't interact like that in public. In addition, it was against Roman law to mourn executed criminals. By the way, the moment Pilate gave Joseph the body, the right to the body, he was saying Jesus was innocent because he didn't treat Jesus as a true criminal. You see, criminals did not receive burial. They got thrown into a mass grave, or they got left on the cross. If it wasn't uh, in Jerusalem, if it wasn't uh, there, they would just be left on the cross. These women... They plan to return at the first opportunity, and they will. In fact, they come, according to John, they come to the tomb, it's still dark. It's what we call Sunday morning, but it's still dark. First light is just starting to creep over the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. They go and get what they can on that Friday late. They get the rest of it Saturday probably late, and they plan to go on Sunday as early as possible. Why? Because they love Jesus. And they want to honor, they want to honor him. They want to honor his burial. Guards are posted. Now, if you are a guard and you're posted to guard something, do you fall asleep? That's going to be important. We'll mention that here in just a moment. Okay? Guards traditionally do not fall asleep. They guard. Let's go to story number 158. Story number 158. Resurrection Sunday. We have now left the final week. Okay? Yes, I know this is not part of the final week. That's true. But you can't end the story on Saturday. That's not a good ending. The story is not complete without Resurrection Sunday. And then Jesus showing himself for 40 days. Remember the importance of 40 days, the number 40. 40 is always a testing period. 40 days in the, 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years for Moses in the desert. Uh, 40 days uh, for Jesus before the temptations. It's always a testing period. It was a testing period for the faith of those new followers of Jesus. We're going to be looking at his resurrection and we're going to look at his ascension back to the Father. Throughout the book of Acts and the epistles, the resurrection of Jesus is proclaimed as the cornerstone of our faith. Without the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus was just a good person, okay? Without the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus was just a good person. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In that first sermon that Peter preached, what does he talk about? The resurrected Savior. Then look at Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captains of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus, what? The resurrection. The resurrection from the dead. Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 33, and with great power the apostles gave witness to what? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus. His resurrection. Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter, excuse me, chapter 23. Acts chapter 23, verse 6. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. 
Paul preached what? The resurrection. Acts 24. Acts 24, verse 15. I have hope in God, which them themselves are also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead. A resurrection of the dead. Romans chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by what? The resurrection from the dead. I could go on and on. Acts, uh, Romans 6 verse 5, uh, Paul compares our baptism to a resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, the majority of that chapter is all about resurrection. You might say the apostles had a one message, message. And that one message was resurrection. Without the resurrection, Jesus was just a good person. So we need to talk about this resurrection. Even though we believe, even though we believe, there are skeptics out there. Skeptics out there. Notice on your outline, we're going to talk about some theories. The skeptics denounce the idea of a resurrection. They often uh, propose one of five theories in an attempt to explain away the empty tomb. Tonight, let's prove the skeptics wrong. Skeptic theory number one. It's called the stolen body theory. Here's how it works. The disciples came and stole the body. Uh, I think the Jewish leaders started this theory. They, they stole the body, and then what did they do? They spread the hoax of his resurrection. This was the original theory that was concocted by the Jewish leadership. Matthew chapter 28. However... This theory faces some giant problems. Motive and ability. First off, why is this theory dead wrong? Let's talk about motive. To believe this theory, you've got to take these 11 guys, and remember, where are they at this moment? Well, Friday they run away, Saturday they're hiding. Even Sunday, they're hiding behind closed doors. Why? Well, as the little boy would say, they're scaredy cats. They're scared. And they're hiding. Now, you've got to believe that these frightened men would come after Saturday morning. Now, why would I say after Saturday morning? Remember the Jewish leaders approached Pilate about posting a guard? That was on Saturday. We would assume probably early on Saturday. I'm sure when they went out there to post that guard, they said, we better check, make sure that his body's in there. So I kind of believe, I can't prove it, but I kind of believe that they probably said, let's roll that stone away for just a moment. Let's look at it. There, there's his body. Okay, let's seal it back up and let's put the seal on it now. This is to say, if you believe in the stolen body theory, you believe that those 11 men somehow on Saturday night or early, or early, early Sunday morning were able to sneak in, get past a guard's and notice it said guard, it was plural, more than one man. Get past guards, they were able to roll that stone away, and they, not, they did not just take the body, they actually then took the, the burial clothes and put everything neat. And then left the garden area by rolling the stone back over there, and they left. Can you, is that believable? No, no. Furthermore, how many of those original 11 died a natural death? 
Answer, we don't know for sure. We think only John died a natural death. In other words, the others, now when Matthias was added, get back to 12, the other 11 died a violent death. And not just those 11. Many, many Christians died a violent death. Would you die for something that was fake? I, I know I wouldn't. I don't think you either would want to die for something that was fake. Motive? That's a very, very silly motive to give up your life for something that's fake. Ability? Boy, they are really something to be able to sneak in there with guards posted and do all this and get out with nobody seeing them. Skeptic theory number two. <laughs> the swoon theory. This theory says, well, Jesus, he never really died. He only swooned, you know, kind of passed out. And then later he resuscitated after he was put in that burial, the burial uh, garments. Why is this theory dead wrong? Number one, just being in that burial garments, the linen and being tightly wound up and all that, he would have what? Can't breathe. Can't breathe. He, he would have died in that. Furthermore, <laughs> furthermore, remember the condition of Jesus' body? His side was pierced by a Roman soldier. Blood and water came out. So he's got a major gash to his body, blood and water coming out. He's been beaten, not just by the Jewish people, he was beaten also by the Roman soldiers. He had been on a cross for six hours. How can you even think a body could survive something like that? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make logic sense. But the swoon theory would say, well, it does. It does make sense. He just, uh, he passed out and he was resuscitated. And then the last problem with it is, how did he get out? Remember, a stone is in front of the entrance. A stone, if you have enough strength, you can move it if you're outside because you can grip the edges of it and you can move it. How can you, you can't grip the edges if you're inside. Think about that. You can't grip the edges. There's no way. I mean, you'd have to put your, your hands on it and hope that the friction of your hands you know, was enough to cause the stone to move. Not very likely. In fact, I would say it's zero percent. Skeptic theory number three. Wrong tomb. This theory says that the women, and then later Peter and John, they all went to the wrong tomb. They were supposed to go to this tomb, and they went to that tomb. And they mistakenly thought that Jesus was raised from the dead. Why is this theory dead wrong? I've already mentioned this was a private tomb. You know... If you go to one of our public cemeteries, you might, if I told you to go to so-and-so's grave, you might go to the wrong one because it's a big cemetery, big, massive cemetery. A few years ago, I, I officiated a funeral. The family had their own private burial uh, area. It was on the back side of their farm. I knew exactly where to go. I knew where their farm was. Uh, I knew it was on the back side of the farm. I knew it was next to the creek bank. I knew where the creek was. I mean, I, I, there's no way I could get lost. I knew exactly where I was going. There was only, I think, five, uh, there was only five uh, 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 bodies buried there. How could the women who actually was sitting opposite watching, how could these women... How could they know, how could they go to the wrong tomb? And remember John, even though Peter wasn't at the cross, John had been at the cross. 
And remember, the garden tomb is near Golgotha. It doesn't make sense that they would go to the wrong tomb. They knew exactly what tomb to go to. It was a private tomb. Theory number four, hallucinations. This theory says that the disciples wanted so badly for Jesus to be raised that they hallucinated his appearances. Why is this theory dead wrong? One person, it's possible for them to have a hallucination. Maybe two people could have this, maybe I'd say maybe could have the same hallucination. Go over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is what he is pointing out what the witness is. Jesus did not just appear to one or two. He didn't appear just to Mary Magdalene and maybe John and Peter. He appeared to all these different people time and time and time. At one time, 500 at one time. How could over 500 people have the same hallucination? Once again, let's use good old, as my mother would say, good old common horse sense. Good old common horse sense says it's not possible. This theory is dead wrong. Theory number five, or excuse me, before we get to theory number five, a related theory to the hallucination theory is that Jesus' resurrection was only spiritual and not physical. Why is this theory dead wrong? Thomas, look at my hands. Look at my side. Look at my feet. Uh, what is, what's Jesus doing? You have anything to eat? There on the Sea of Galilee, what's he doing? He's cooking breakfast for everybody. Jesus was not just spiritual. He was physical. He had a resurrected body. They recognized those holes, uh, uh, the side. They recognized all of that. His resurrection was not limited just to the spiritual side. It was physical. Because he said, check it out. Check it out. Here I am. Check it out. Now, let's look at theory number five. Theory number five. They say the gospel accounts are a literary work of pure fiction with little basis in historic reality. Boy, did they miss the mark on this one. The gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are daring the people of the first century. Go check it out. Check out our story. What does Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John keep on doing? They keep on giving us names places, events, leaders. They wanted people to check them out. If you lived in the first century, and let's say you got a copy of the book of Matthew. Well, let's back up. You got a copy of Mark, because Mark was probably the first of the four written, we think. Okay, Mark says that uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Let's go to Bethlehem. Little town outside of Jerusalem. Let's go. Hey, anyone remember uh, about 30 years ago, uh, a couple having a baby uh, born, you know, in a kind of an odd place here in Bethlehem? Yeah, we remember that story. Go to Nazareth. Hey, do you remember a guy named Joseph? Uh, I think he was a, a carpenter and he had a son. His oldest son was Jesus. Do you remember him? Yeah, yeah. Even the names of the leaders that sometimes mankind says, hey, the Bible made a mistake. Time and time again, the Bible is proven correct. The Bible was proven correct about Pontius Pilate, 
an inscription engraved on a plaque, on a, on, on a marble slab found in Caesarea Maritima. It gave the correct name for Pontius Pilate. It gave the correct office. Because historians said, well, the Bible made a mistake. They called him by the wrong title. Not according to what Pontius Pilate had engraved on that marble slab. Or how about Luke? Luke chapter 3. The name of the Syrian leader. The Syrian governor. Well, hey, hey, uh, that's, that's wrong. Then they find out, well, uh-oh, it's right. Because he served twice. Because at first they said, no, he served before what we would call A.D. time period. He served in the B.C. time period. But then they found out, well, oh, okay, he served both B.C. and A.D. Okay, we made a mistake. You see, the Bible proves itself. It proves itself. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are challenging people. You go check us out. If I, if I wanted to create a story, Larry, if I wanted to create a story about Michael, Superman Michael, okay? Okay, look at me, uh, puny muscles, but I'm Superman Michael. I want to create a story about Superman Michael. And I want people to believe in that story. I'm not going to give you details where you can check it out. I'm not going to tell you where I lived. I'm not going to tell you when I, uh, when I uh, was born. I'm not going to tell you when I died. I'm going to give you as vague a story as I can because I know if you come to Hot Springs, hey, that Michael, he wasn't a Superman at all. He was puny. You see, if you want to create a story that is not real, but you want to make people believe it's real, you don't give them the details. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they give us the details. And they... They are challenging all of us, even us today. Prove us wrong. Okay, just prove us wrong. Our faith hinges on the resurrection. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 12. First Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there's no resurrection of the dead? Why would you say that? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. Why are we even here if there's no resurrection? Yes, and we found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not raise. For if the dead do not raise, then Christ is not risen. Paul says, if there's no resurrection, then Jesus is not resurrected. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. The only way all of this works is for the resurrection to work. The only way all this makes sense is for the resurrection to work. Those five theories are dead wrong. Because if you will just use good old common horse sense, they don't make any sense at all. We believe in a resurrected Savior. Amen? Amen. Now, in just a moment, I want to answer those questions that came up. Uh, let me tell you what's going to happen on Sunday. On Sunday, we're going to look at the women finding the empty tomb, what all happens with that, okay? 
Uh, also, we will talk about uh, uh, why they came, who actually came, and why do it looks like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John don't necessarily agree with what, who women came. We will explain that there's no discrepancy. We'll talk about how those lists actually do match. Also on Sunday, we're going to talk about uh, the timeline on the resurrection, what happened first, what happened second, what happened third. And then if we have time, we're going to talk about what? We're going to talk about why the stone was rolled away. The stone was not rolled away for Jesus. Jesus did not need that stone to be rolled away that stone was rolled away for us to look in the empty tomb. Now, let me go ahead and answer the two questions that was emailed to me, and then let's see if we have any... Oh, uh, we do have a question for here, so good, we got a question for here. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to answer this question first and the email question second. Here comes this question. When the tomb was sealed and the guard set in Matthew 27, what was the sealing process? If it was a typical Roman process, okay, if it was typical Roman process, what they did, it was they would actually take a string and put it over the tomb, and they would take the end of the string and then take a hot wax, and they would then, you know, attach the string to the stone. And then if it's a Roman if it's a Roman seal, if it's a Roman sealing, they would then take the Roman uh, ring of Pilate and put it into that wax, signifying that this was officially sealed. And it's kind of like, you know, when the police, you know, go, don't, don't cross it, you know, the, the yellow, yellow tape, you know, you, you see, and you know, don't cross. Well, you don't, you don't break a seal. That seal was there. The seal was there to signify that this is to be left alone. Okay? So that's how, if it's a typical Roman way of sealing, that's how they did it back then. The two questions that were emailed to me. Question one. The person who had a question about the, the nail prints. Because I, I mentioned that uh, more likely the nail prints went right about here. Okay? Not here in the palm, but right here. And uh, the question was, why did they do that? Well, the Romans did that for basically one reason, more stability. If you put it here, it can tear, and the, actually the limb could be torn away from the, uh, from the cross beam. Now, funny thing, people will do experiments on the weirdest stuff. There was, a, uh, there was a professor that did an experiment on cadavers. And he did determine there is one place in the palm that if you hit it just right, it can give stability uh, to, the, to the nailing of the hand to the cross. So maybe there is an outside chance that it was more in the palm but more likely, the typical way that the Romans liked to do it was right about here because you got more stability because they don't want that body to jerk off and fall off of the tomb. So that's the reason why they did it here and not necessarily there. Second question. The question was, they said that, uh, remember when Jesus cried that he was thirsty? One of the seven sayings, I thirst. And someone ran and got him something and, and held it up. The question was, Michael, I thought you said that the cross wasn't that high. Well, the cross wasn't that high. It, very unlikely. You know, in the pictures, we see people painting the cross. Usually the picture is the cross where the feet of Jesus is about like five, six feet off the ground. And you have to look up like this. That's not likely. He's more like uh, five or six inches off the ground. So still, you would have to, you know, you would have to, to, to go up with uh, the drink. Uh, but it's not like, um, it's not like what they picture. What's the famous painting of uh, Mary, and she's kind of at the cross, and Jesus is on the cross, and, and she's at the foot of the cross. What's that famous painting? Okay. Uh, I thought she would know. Um, 
But there's a famous painting by, by some famous artist, and you see supposedly Mary, and she's at the cross, and she's all kind of like this, and she's kind of grasping the cross, and, and her head and the feet of Jesus is like way up here, and her head's right here, you know. So, uh, as I said, not, thank you, uh, not likely, you know, he was more like five or six inches off the ground. Why did they do that? It's to create more fear. They wanted you to see. They didn't want you to have to look up because you might miss it. If you look up, you might miss it. They want you as you're coming in Jerusalem. And remember, they're going to have a lot of people coming in Jerusalem. You've got the Passover. You've got heavy traffic. You've got, uh, if you look at the Geneth Gate, you've got two roads that come together right there and then come through the gate. You've got a lot of people coming into the city. You don't want people to have to look up and you know, might miss it. They want people to see it. They want to get more bang, in this case fear, for the buck. They want to create as much fear as they can. So usually the person on the cross is not that uh, high up off the ground. Also, it helped because the soldiers, when they put in that cross beam up, one soldier's on one end, other soldier's on this end. They can reach up and then hold it up like this and then fit it into that little notch and connect it in. They don't have to have a ladder. They can do it right there. Makes it a little bit more convenient for them. Uh, let's see, anything else? we got about two minutes. I don't see anything else. Um, <sighs> I would expect us to be, we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to cover the, uh, the Resurrection Sunday. We've got uh, that. We're going to cover also his uh, resurrection appearances. We'll have one lesson that comes from Acts 2 with the start of the church. And then this study will end. So I'm guessing probably middle of October. That's when Genesis starts. And get ready. I'm excited for Genesis because Genesis is going to be, you know, like that elder said, if you want to have a better understanding of God, get a better understanding of the book of Genesis. Because the book of Genesis is going to really open up our eyes to Jesus. Coming up Sunday morning, Jericho, Joshua chapter 6. Coming up Sunday night, Revelation 9, the first half of Revelation 9. We've already had... The three things that brought down Rome, natural disasters, that was chapter 8. First half of 9, moral decay. The last half of chapter 9, which will be October the 10th, enemies all around us, outside enemies. That's the three things that brought down Rome. You are dismissed. Appreciate you all. Love you all. Thank you. If you would take this back to the back for me.